All right, we are we are going live here. Just gonna hit live on Facebook. All right, All right. we are. <laughs> You're already getting positive feedback. <laughs> uh, I love positive feedback. Echoing is my favorite thing in the world. I think it's Audi over here. Um, okay, so um, I think let's just get the microphone going here. Welcome everybody to another HA chat. We're live right here from San Jose, California. Courtney and I are in the same room. I know it doesn't look <laughs> like that, but we sometimes can just do this. <laughs> <laughs> and Mitch is in between. So <laughs> that was well, a like to be <laughs> <laughs> actually pass through Mitch. <laughs> Did you guys see that? Because you're not going to see it again. All right, so um, so <laughs> we are really, really excited here. Uh, first and foremost, this is our last episode for um, uh, before we take our hiatus for the summer. So um, we're going to be off uh, through July and back the first week of August. Um, really excited to uh, get our content in order for the next uh, season of HTH Chat. Um, we've got some really fun things coming. This is also uh, sponsored in part by Own Your Line which is a uh, community-driven membership site that helps people to uh, build their personal brands in part building their own business through lead generation, social media, and marketing activities. And we're also excited to be um, uh, really looking at uh, content for the future. So during the course of this, we're going to be sending out a, 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 a um, a survey over uh, a link both on Facebook. This is live streaming on Facebook and on Twitter slash YouTube. We're going to be sending that survey out and we'd really love it if you would fill that out because it's going to help us craft more content for more great seasons. Um, we like to serve up content that you appreciate rather than giving you stuff that you're not, you're not enjoying. <laughs> it's always better when we're delivering stuff that you really enjoy and really helps you in your business. So if you wouldn't mind taking literally three minutes or less to fill that survey out, again, we'll, we'll uh, share the link out, then that would be really, really helpful. So please do that and that'll help uh, construct our next season. Okay, housekeeping is all in order. With Without further ado, I'd love to introduce the guy on the screen, one of our favorite people in this world, um, Mitch Jackson. He enjoys combining law, social media, and live streaming to disrupt, hack, and improve his clients' companies, causes, and professional relationships. In addition to being an award-winning 2009 Orange County Trial Lawyer of the Year and 2013 California Litigation Lawyer of the Year, he also enjoys speaking. And I know that because I have seen, uh, actually, I haven't, had, I haven't been able to see Mitch speak live, but I've seen him at lots of events. We're always uh, seem to be bumping into each other at those events, which is great. Um, he's not when he's not trying cases, Mitch uses social media and technology to help good attorneys become great trial lawyers and to show everyone, not just lawyers, how to effectively communicate and negotiate, which is today's topic. Um, it's how to remain human in high stakes business negotiations. Um, such an incredible topic, as you know, because we're not only focused on humans, we're focused on social media and we're going through uh, lots of lots of different changes in social media, and that drives differences in our businesses, which is diff I'm sure causing lots of differences in relationships. And as that happens, we need people like Mitch to help teach us what to do in those high stakes uh, areas. So his his bio goes on. I'm just going to highlight just a few more things. He's an early adopter of live streaming. I, I have to. I have to. Sorry. <laughs> Why don't you um, just say he's a badass? He is a and badass. We're done. He's speaking we're done. at Social Media Day in San Diego. He's been profiled by David Merriman Scott. He is an expert in in um, in, in evidence in California, and he's appeared on live video shows like Katie Katie Couric, Anderson Cooper, Seth Godin, Peter Diamandis, I think I said that right, and Gary Vaynerchuk, and his weekly li own live show, The Show Live. Okay, so without further ado, how are you doing, Mitch? Welcome to the HA Chat Show. I'm doing fantastic, you guys. Courtney and Brian, it's good to see you, and it's great to be on your show. I'm a big fan, and I feel I uh, filled out your questionnaire earlier today. So. Oh, thank you for doing that. Thank yes, you for doing that. Yes, it's going to be great. But okay. this is an exciting time to be alive. I mean, with social, with digital, with everything that's going on, 
you know, one of the reasons I wanted to jump on when you guys reached out is that negotiation is so important, right? Yeah. Whether we're talking about a business to customer, business to client, whether we're home on the weekend trying to negotiate with our loved ones, which what to have for dinner or what movie to see, you got to love negotiation. There's all different types of angles and approaches. Yeah, I'm actually just here to figure out how to deal with my son, who's 13. So mm. <laughs> I'm going to give you some ideas, all right? He's the future attorney of, of the world, so... <laughs> That's fantastic. So, so uh, just to just to kick it off, I know that we went over your bio, but I was just curious. Um, as everyone knows, you are you're a, you're a lawyer that also an engage, really loves technology and how technology works, as well as social media. So the marketing aspect, the technology aspect, and then the legal aspect. How did you find um, yourself in this pa this place where you're kind of intersecting all of these different things? Because I don't think that that's typical of the legal field in, in what I've seen so far. It's not typical at all. The legal field's about 10 years behind when we're creating laws and regulations and statutes from where technology is. But Brian, for me, it goes all the way back to my early days before practicing law, before going to law school. I've always been interested in technology. I've always been interested in digital. And we put up our first website back around 95, 96. And six months later, had a large case come into the law firm because of that website. And I've never been accused of being the brightest bulb in the lamp. But when that case came in, I thought to myself, there's something about this internet thing. And so we've been actively involved, you know, on the digital platforms ever since. And I've gotten to meet great people, especially with social media over the last seven or eight years. It's really changed everything with making great connections, meeting people like you, meeting people. We have a lot of common friends in the audience and it's just been a fun ride and it makes my day more enjoyable. After 30 years of practicing law, my friends, uh, I'm still excited about getting up in the morning and it's because of social and it's because of digital. Wow. Wow. I love that. I feel like I just need to ask one question to get it out of the way. Sure. Can you handle the truth? <laughs> as long as my client's telling the truth, I can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's all I needed to know. <laughs> Look at you. I feel, so you're going to pull a Tom Cruise on me, are you? <laughs> I so, am a movie buff. <laughs> great courtroom scene, by the way. Um, you, um, so what What do you see that, that people in, especially in social media and marketing do every day that um, when it comes to negotiation, that means that something had to happen in order to become a negotiated situation. That means that we're either arguing, we're not in agreement, there's a point of contention. There's uh, two, one thing that one person wants to get out of something and someone else wants something else. Sure. What is it that, um, why is it that, uh, that people, when they, they come together, they're, they're at opposing sides and how do you start to form a way so that it doesn't get too far out of hand? Well, the reason that happens, Brian, is because we're human beings and as human beings, we're emotional. Human beings allow their emotions to dictate what they do to help determine what decisions they make and what paths they'll be taking in life. And when you hear experienced negotiators say you need to separate the people from the problem that's being negotiated, I think that's wrong. You actually have to understand the emotions behind the people involved in a negotiation so that you can collaborate and work together to bring people together on things that you either agree on or issues that you don't agree on, but you bring people together for a joint and final decision. And I think only by tapping into someone else's emotions, their why, why do they feel this way? That's really what allows you to take, you know, a people from different perspectives and bring them together and find a common negotiated solution or outcome. And before we get into this too far, there are five steps to the negotiation process, Brian. I just want to share this with the audience in case we don't get through all five steps today. And the first thing is you have to focus on being a human being. That's number one. Number two, you have to prepare to succeed before you start your negotiation. Number three, you need to start your negotiation with specific intent and with a specific purpose. And we can get into the details if you'd like to. Number four, you need to engage and build rapport with everyone else involved in the negotiation. And number five, you need to close the deal. I've seen so many businesses through negotiation, through arbitration, through mediation, 
do the first four steps really, really well, but they fail to follow up on the fifth step of actually closing the deal. Mm -hmm. So it's because we're human, Brian. That's why we see so many small and large issues out there, especially on the digital platforms and especially in the business world. Do you think that that's going to change with, uh, with the likes of artificial intelligence and negotiation systems that can help solve cases faster uh, by uh, delivering, um, you know, the, and, and we actually had somebody on HCA chat before that had built an AI system for negotiation, which is kind of ironic, um, but they, they ran against some challenges. I'm sure you real, you know what those challenges are. Um, what do you think, what do you think about that? And, and the human negotiation versus the, the AI negotiation? Well, you brought up Peter Diamandis' name earlier, and we were on a show with the Wall yeah. Street Journal. And what Peter told me is he said, Mitch, I would rather have an AI lawyer that's won the last 999 cases than put all my trust in you, someone who I haven't met before. Okay. AI is the future of everything we're talking about. And when I'm speaking this Friday down in San Diego at Social Media Day San Diego, and I know you're speaking in Denver. I'm going to be talking about a cloud-based AI type of system where when we're putting together our blog posts, our streams, our podcasts, and we're using content, pictures, audios, videos, you'll be able to take this file, upload it into a cloud-based AI type of system, artificial intelligence type of system, and it will be able to tell you whether or not you're violating anybody's intellectual property rights wow. or copyrights. And that's down the road five to 10 years depending on how exponentially fast everything happens. I see the same thing happening with the negotiation process. Yes, there will be tools out there that will allow AI to assist the parties, to assist the human beings in their negotiation efforts. Now, having said that, and I want you to think about, remember the first computers that were taking on chess champions? You know, this is a very similar type of thing because there's more involved in negotiation than a structured A, B, C, or D. We have personalities, we have tendencies, we have uh, per, uh, emotions involved. And so until AI can wrap its head, its digital head around all of these other issues, I think humans still will be intricately involved in the AI uh, negotiation process when it happens. Wow. So wait, when everything is up in the cloud and you can know exactly if you're violating someone's copyright that's the day that everyone cries because they realize there's no new ideas out there. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to come back to that, Courtney, because that's going to be a game changer. It's going to save a lot of people a lot of headaches uh, with the content that they're using. And, and along the same lines, I see the cloud-based AI services providing content to creators to avoid getting into an IP violation issue in the first place. Right. Uh, so, so it's gonna be a very powerful tool and I'm gonna share this with the creators in San Diego because until that happens, we have to be careful with what we do. You have to be careful with violating somebody else's intellectual property rights. If you do, guess what's going to happen? You're gonna need a good negotiator. You're gonna need a good negotiator to keep you out of a claim with an arbitration or mediation or out of a jury trial. So that's why I'm excited about talking uh, about the art of negotiation today, because I've watched it change lives. I've watched negotiations take uh, previously, you know, uh, by, you know, previously, previous issues where people just were never going to agree and a good negotiator, uh, one that I'm thinking of a retired judge came together and brought the parties together over a period of four days. And by the time they were done, uh, one party wrote a large check to the other side, but they also gave each other a big hug at the end of the negotiation, and they are also continuing to do business today. Wow. Now that's win-win negotiation. And when I saw that happen, it was a few years ago, it really uh, re-energized my, my interest in the negotiation or the art of negotiation because it can change lives, it can help businesses prosper, and it can help all of us be more productive, especially on the digital platforms. So your second step is prepare to succeed. Um, if both sides are pre preparing to succeed, um, but one side loses, <laughs> Is it success? <laughs> well, look, it depends on the type of negotiation. If somebody has, um, if you're negotiating the, the price of a product or service that your company sells, okay, where you would like 
you know, uh, it to be a hundred dollars, your customers looking for fifty dollars, and you strike and negotiate a rate at seventy-five dollars. Is that a win? Is that a loss? What are the long-term uh, return on investment with keeping that client or customer happy over the long term? It depends on the circumstances, Brian. Uh, when we talk about negotiation, I like to see negotiations happen where everybody loses when it's all said and done. If, if, if everybody's not happy with the final outcome, but they agree to that outcome, it's probably a successful negotiation. On the other side of the coin, if somebody's taken something of my clients and we want it back, we're not going to settle until we get that back. I'm not interested in making that other party or the other side happy. All I'm interested in is getting results from my clients. So it kind of depends on the circumstances of why you're negotiating. But to prepare for negotiation, it's so important that you do your research. I understand if I was negotiating something with you and Courtney in Pure Matter, I would want to know the why behind what are you guys doing and what's your interest in this particular issue and what's your long-term play? What's your long-term goal? How emotionally attached are you to the issue that we're negotiating? Is this something where it's just a game? To the two of you or is this something that you absolutely need to have uh, for the business to continue and so by me understanding where the other side's coming from it allows me to counsel my client and walk into a negotiation uh, and and do the best job possible so each situation is different it just depends on on the circumstances when, so when you're when you're dealing with um you're dealing with emotion and um, and 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 you started off with number one, saying focus on being human. But being human is very emotional. It's very um, it's very um, imperfect, and um, and and indecisive, and all the things that come with being human. Yeah. The uh, the challenge of that is that there is no clear uh, idea as to how the why the other person is is thinking the way they are and what they they even know they want or why they want it. Um, and when I say person, it could be a company. Sure. Um, but um, when you're dealing with in, with emotions, what have you learned along the way in managing those emotions to a better outcome? What I've learned is to ask open-ended questions and stop talking and start listening. I think in negotiations, the more you listen, the more you learn. What? <laughs> Courtney, can you reach over and just slap them for me, please? <laughs> This is another effective negotiation technique. It's called the hand. <laughs> and uh, by asking open-ended questions and then listening to the response, and I mean actively listening, really caring about what the other person's saying, it allows you to get a better feel of where their, where their emotions are, what their interests are, Brian. I always do strongly recommend that people treat other people with kindness. In other words, be kind to people but be hard on the issues. So one way you can avoid emotionally um, harming somebody or upsetting somebody or hurting their feelings is to be kind to the other person, but be, but be strong or hard on the issues. And that's worked really well for us. It's not always easy, but it is always necessary. And you'll see experienced negotiators actually uh, use that technique and actually leave a room uh, before engaging somebody in a one-on-one uh, -on -one type of confrontation. I've seen negotiations become physical, mm. you know, where it's almost like going to a hockey game. And as entertaining as that is, nothing gets done, right? So we don't want that to happen. Yeah, I remember being at a meditation. I, I went to a, a meditation um, uh, event once where everyone sat there and they started meditating. These two roommates, one guy wasn't paying his rent. And here we are sitting at med uh, meditation of all places, <laughs> and it broke out into a fist fight and then into a brawl. And um, and I remember thinking to myself, if if an argument can break out between two roommates about uh, not paying rent at a meditation, <laughs> then a fight can happen anywhere. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's it's important to remember that demeanor oftentimes will get you further in a negotiation than substance. OK, being a likable person, uh, understanding where the other person is. But Brian, at this point and Courtney, at this point, before going into a negotiation, and that's kind of the frame, uh, the, the time frame we're talking about before walking in to a negotiation, you do want to do a couple of things. You want to figure out what's my final purpose here. Okay, what is it that I want to walk away? Bottom line, what do we need to walk away uh, with 
from this negotiation. What am I able or willing to give up? You have to understand the answers to those two questions before you start the negotiation process. The other thing you need to do is you need to phrase key comments, statements, or questions that I can talk to the two of you about. Let's say you have an app that you want to sell me for a certain amount of money. It's an, it's an amount of money that I'm not interested in paying, but you want to sell me an app, and this app will help eliminate reduce or get rid of bullying online or distracted driving online okay so you guys created the app because you want to stop distracted driving and bullying i want to buy the app because i want to do the same thing and make it a commercial product and, and, and monetize it so before you go into a negotiation have a statement worked out so that whenever you reach an impasse whenever things get heated uh, whenever there's tension before you drop gloves and start throwing blows you want to have the statement where brian and courtney listen you created this app to save lives, to, to keep people from distracted driving. We want to purchase your app to do the same thing. What do we need to do to keep this deal moving forward? Mm. So if you have a statement that you can come back to, and it's a statement that you want to craft before you start your negotiation, every time you start going sideways, you can come back to that statement, and that will keep things moving forward in a positive fashion. So I highly recommend people do that. Mm. What's the best way to diffuse your own emotions when you find yourself in a situation negotiating, do you have any tactics on how to like, just take a time out? <laughs> you have to give yourself a time out. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and wh what I tell people, and, and uh, I think this was in the book, getting to yes, if I'm not mistaken, is I always treat negotiations as a game. Uh, I take what we're negotiating very seriously, but I don't let the other side know that. OK, I care about what we're negotiating, but I, I give the other side the perception that what we're negotiating, regardless of what happens, it just doesn't mean that much to me or my client. So if you can give that type of perception to the other side uh, and you have to have a good poker face to do that, that's how you create a situation, Courtney, where you don't get worked up and you don't get emotional. Because frankly, look, guys, I'd like to buy this app for you and save the world and make our streets safer for our kids. But if you're not interested in coming down in the, in the price and making this a reasonable negotiation, we'll go someplace else and get the app. Now, inside, I may be burning up, right? I might be really upset that you wasted my time to fly up to San Jose to do this deal. OK, but I will never let you see that. The perception has to remain calm, confident and focused. What if you're not in a courtroom and you're in, say, your son's bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> Well, now you're talking about a type of negotiation where you're holding all the cards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you are the judge and the jury. So, you know, I, we were talking before we went live. I've got a 22-year-old daughter and a 17-year-old son. And I think I stopped winning those negotiations, Courtney, a few years ago. <laughs> Just being real here. So you want to, you know, the other thing about negotiations is that's a good point because you don't normally want to burn bridges in negotiations. You want to think long term. Oftentimes in business, you're negotiating a, a, a claim, a product, a service, a price. You want to think long term and maintain that long term business relationship, right? There's many, many more deals down the road. As a lawyer, when we're dealing with opposing counsel, we normally don't want to burn bridges because I'll be dealing with that attorney over the next 20 years on the next 50 cases. So you want to be careful with how you handle negotiations. Sometimes, though, you do want to come in and throw a right hook and just take the other side out and move on and never plan on seeing that person or company again. I get that. When it comes to kids, when it comes to spouses and loved ones, when it comes to partners, I think it's really important for all of us to deflect, reflect, and select. And that's something that I've come up with. And what I mean by that is when somebody says something, the first thing you need to do is pretend like you're a piece of Teflon and you need to let whatever was just said to you deflect off of you. Don't immediately react, whether you're at home negotiating with your teenage son or whether I'm in court negotiating with opposing counsel during a break. You then need to reflect upon what options you have. What's my best response? How should I reply? Should I reply at all? And then you select your response. So deflect, reflect, and select. And if you do that, especially with teenagers, I think it keeps us from saying things that we regret saying later on, from saying things that, you know, over the next couple of years that might interfere with our relationships with our kids over the next 30 years. That's been my challenge. I always like to think long-term. 
But when you figure it out, I want you to let me know and I'll have you on my show. <laughs> <laughs> I think we would be bazillionaires if we could figure that out. <laughs> So exactly. we, we have a Q&A coming up here soon. Uh, if, if you would like to ask Mitch a question, uh, um, you have a question for him, all you have to do is just uh, drop your question, either it, whether you're on Twitter or on Facebook, drop your question inside of the tweet with the hashtag H2H, H number two H chat, or in the Facebook uh, stream, you can drop your question there. Uh, Maya is standing by waiting for your questions. She'll pick those up and we will get started in uh, let's see, in about five five to seven minutes, we'll start asking those questions uh, of Mitch and um, and be able to get you some answers. Um, Mitch, we're on number four here, and your your um, number four was engage. Uh, just to anybody who, who just arrived, I'll, I'll, I'll say, say the five things one more time. Um, the five steps to a su successful negotiation. Fo number one, focus on being a human being. Number two, prepare to succeed. Number three, start the negotiation with intention and purpose. Number four, engage and build rapport during the negotiation. And number five, close the deal. We've gone through the first three. We're on number four. Um, Mitch, uh, engage and build rapport. My question for you is um, what happens when the other person does not want to engage? They do not want to build rapport. They could give a you know what about actually doing that. And all they care about is themselves. What then? Yeah, th that's a challenging situation. Once, once again, it sounds like we're back to the teenage negotiations, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and what, what, what I was going to get at is a really powerful tool that I'm sure you guys are aware of, but maybe some people in the audience aren't, is a concept called mirroring. And mirroring has to do with, um, it's essentially it's imitation. You're basically connecting with the other person that you're negotiating with through your tone of voice, through how you speak, through your body language, uh, through anything that the other person can see, hear, smell, touch, whatever it might be, that's called mirroring. And so, Brian, a, a good approach is to, you know, use mirroring when you're negotiating and when you reach an impasse. Um, at that point in time, you know, start to mirror the other person. In other words, ask an open-ended question. If the other person puts their hand up like this and looks over to the side, it's okay if you put your hand up and look over at the side. I mean, mirror what they're doing. Try to build rapport and a connection with the other person. If they go sideways and start talking about last night's baseball game, instead of responding to your question because they know you're not going to like what they've got to say, take it down that path for a couple of minutes. Talk about the baseball game. You're mirroring what's of interest to them or what they want you to perceive is at interest to them. They may be playing you. Okay. And teenagers are really good at that, Courtney. And so I think mirroring is key. The FBI has a mirroring technique that works really well. And that mirroring technique has to do with using the last three key words that somebody else says. So if you're at an impasse and somebody says something to you, Think about the last three words that they used in their sentence or the last most important three words they used in their sentence and think for a second and come back to them and repeat what they just said using those last three words and then stop talking and start listening and listen to what the other person has to say. And by using these last three keywords and repeating them and mirroring somebody, oftentimes that will get the conversation going back down the correct path towards a final negotiated solution. Oh, that's great advice. So a final negotiated solution is what you're recommending. Ideally, I'd like a final negotiated solution with a big check coming to my client and opposing counsel on his or her knees just going like this saying, you are fantastic. That would be <laughs> awesome, Courtney. That hasn't happened in 30 years, but that would be my ideal solution. She's a quick study, by the way. She that was is. my attempt at. Yeah, yeah, I'm getting this. I'm getting this. Brian, you're in trouble, my friend. <laughs> she's a quick study. She's she's already been through your your five, and she's back now at one. She's, you know, oh, she is. Yes, I, I can't wait to hear the stories after this. The other thing is is to use when you reach an impasse or somebody's not being cooperative during a negotiation process, use labeling. In other words. Uh, reach out and say something like, it seems to me like what you're trying to say, Courtney, or Courtney, it seems to me what you're feeling or the reason you feel this way, Courtney, is as follows. In other words, continue the conversation and, and take a position and label it and then go down that path and listen to what your response is. And oftentimes, the more information you get, the better off things will, will be. 
a key component to successful negotiation is that you want to have a middleman. You don't want to negotiate on behalf of yourself. Okay, so that when there is an impasse here, what I can do is say, listen, I understand what you're saying, Courtney. I need to go back to my client and I need to talk to my client about what you just shared with me. Let's meet again tomorrow at noon. I'll give you a call or let's meet down here in the conference room and let's follow up on what we just talked about. So by 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 placing yourself between by placing a third party between you and the other side, it gives you a buffer to deflect, reflect and select how you're going to be responding to that impasse. Mm -hmm. We actually found that is so true, not to change the subject, but in influencer programs that, that we manage in influencer mm -hmm. marketing, it's super important to have that third party negotiator on behalf because you're almost like an agent, if you will. <laughs> it's huge. It's, it's a buffer. It's a buffer that allows you not to say something you're going to later on regret. Yeah. A buffer that allows you to, you know, formalize a different type of response or maybe gain something new in, in a negotiation process that you didn't originally think about. So, yes, having a middleman, especially on the larger negotiations, are the way to go. So um, now we're, we're in number five and we did uh, we're, we're getting a few questions here. Keep your questions coming um, and we'll, we'll get to those here in just a second. We're on number five, which is close the deal. Um, and closing the deal, you said that's the one that people miss or skip the most or they don't get to that one. Why and what what do you do for that? Well, the biggest problem I see with negotiation is buyer's remorse. OK, we're done negotiating a deal. You guys go home at night. You talk to a neighbor. You talk to a friend. Uh, after the conversation, you start doubting the decision you agreed to is the right decision to make in this particular negotiation. So it's critically important that when you go into a negotiation, whether it's online or offline, to have your paperwork put together. So if it's a contract, once you're done negotiating and you've come to a, a specific term in that contract, you have the paperwork ready to go. You reach down, you bring it out, you write in that term, and you have everybody sign it immediately. If you're negotiating online, which, by the way, I recommend you negotiate in person, uh, especially on bigger. There's just something about seeing somebody in the same room talking to them, the human to human aspect, that's critical. But if you're negotiating online, you know, have these documents set up with an online platform like DocuSign, all ready to go. So once we're done negotiating, I meet, I reach out through DocuSign, I send you the document, Courtney, Brian, you guys sign it, it gets back over to me. Now we have a binding and final agreement. Hmm. You've got to do this uh, to to protect your rights and to protect your client's interests, especially as an attorney. So, Brian, that's where people drop the ball is they don't document the final decision that's been negotiated between the parties. That's interesting. Um, um, I don't know if you've ever had that happen, but it seems to happen often. Yeah, I'm, it's um, I've I've seen people actually just in business even do it right there and then on a cocktail napkin. Uh, and and they both signed it and actually uh, made sure that it was in writing right right at the <laughs> pull out one of these pull out one of these okay and either hit record or or hit video and record your final terms and conditions and understanding on your smartphone I would have Brian come on Brian is this what you agree to yes Mitch uh, by the way I love the way I look on my smartphone great image <laughs> I do the same thing and then we've got evidence and and generally when you spend the time to document or video or record a final agreement to a negotiated resolution, people don't contest it. It's a done deal. And if they do, there's procedures in court where you can uh, have a summary procedure. It's a fast procedure to have a judge basically rubber stamp the conclusion that was entered into. Awesome stuff. Okay, so um, we're going to get into some questions here. Um, and then we'll obviously we we're always full of questions, so we may slip some in ourselves. Um, the first question is from Jennifer Quinn, uh, our good friend Jennifer. She says, outside of obvious legal issues, what other negotiation conversations do you recommend people hire an attorney for or a mediator? I would say anything that is of major importance in your life. So we're talking primarily about business negotiations. And um, I think for me, from a negotiation standpoint, that's that's really what we're focusing on today. I will tell you that if you have the time and you're negotiating the price of a platform that you're using, or if you're going out to buy a car, or if you're going out to buy a motorcycle, having a middleman 
be the agent to negotiate that, whether it's a spouse, whether it's an, a, an, a teenage son, whoever it might be, having a middleman, Jennifer, will really help during the process and help bring that price down. Once again, in buying a car and paying a particular price on a social media platform by negotiating and letting the other side know you have options and you really, you know, you really don't care if you're going to close this particular deal, those are the buttons that you can push to get the results that you're looking for. Hmm. Okay, next question is uh, from, from Nazim Beltran. Um, I think he's in Italy. Uh, his, in a negotiation process, is it better to have your lawyer run the show and you stay silent or is that detrimental towards the position that has that one has in the room? So it's 99 times out of 100, it's best assuming you have the right lawyer to let the lawyer negotiate on your behalf. That's the general rule. What happens though in many of our um, high stake seven figure negotiations is, and, and maybe the consumers aren't aware of this, is when we go down to a uh, uh, negotiation facility or we're in our office, one party will be in one room, we'll be in another room, and that middleman, that negotiator, will oftentimes go back and forth between the rooms. So oftentimes you don't even meet the other side until the negotiation's over. Okay, so when you're in that room one-on-one -on -one with a retired judge or maybe with me and I'm that negotiator going back and forth, I want you to be yourself. Anything you talk to me about, I'm not going to communicate to the other side. Uh, so that's a more formal type of negotiation process. But I think in a one-on-one, -on -one, if we're all in the same room together, I would suggest following your attorney's lead or following the person who's representing you, follow his or her lead. And uh, that's usually how things will things will work out better if you do that. There's, there's probably a reason why you're in negotiations in the first place. It's probably something you said or something you did. So you don't need to say anything else more or do anything else. Let a professional step in and help you out. I like that. Just shut up is the... <laughs> I don't know the Latin phrase for that, but yes, Courtney, I think that's probably <laughs> the best way to go about it. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Uh, here's a question uh, from Carrie Maslin. Uh, she asks, are you helping your team build their authentic and indiv individual brands? Through negotiation? I guess. <laughs> well, but, but let's talk about this for a second. You know, there's always long-term consequences yes. to anything you say or do, and that includes in the negotiation room. People talk. People in, in the business world talk about other businesses, about whether you're an upstanding, ethical uh, type of person or company. And so, yes, I think it's critically important during, during the negotiation process not to bend on your ethics, not to allow yourself ever to go into the gray area of what's legal or what's appropriate or what's proper. And I actually think that's a very, very good question because what will happen over time, and it does take time, is that if you develop a good reputation, you're able to more effectively and quickly negotiate big deals. So, so that's a that's a great question. Yeah, actually, maybe we want to explore a little bit more into the ethics part because I'm sure that you know if people are dealing with emotions and they're really, really invested and passionate about getting their way, then sometimes would be tempted to <laughs> All the overstep the, the, the lines out of the out of bounds to get what so, they want. So what we do, Courtney, is when that happens, and it happens all the time, uh, normally it's in an A or B type of situation. For some reason, the parties have created a scenario where our options either A or our option is B. Mm. And frankly, neither option is outside of that gray area. They're both bad options. A good negotiator will find and explain to the parties through storytelling, through example, through your body language, that there are actually options C, D, E, F, and G. And so never let anybody paint you into one corner or another. There are always multiple options. That's why having an intermediary saying, listen, I understand what you're saying. Let's take a break and have lunch and come back at two this afternoon. It gives you a chance. It gives you an option of stepping away from the negotiation table and figuring out what options C, D, E, and F are 
And those options obviously are in the very clear green legal and ethical areas. Mm -hmm. So there's a way to do that. Never let anybody paint, your, paint you into a corner. There are no corners when it comes to negotiation. Mm. That's good advice. I, I suppose a good way, if you don't have a middleman, just say, you know, if you're just trying to do something yourself, mind mapping, I think, is a really good way to explore those different options, too. That's where you literally take whatever your issue is and then draw out what the different scenarios could be. And if you don't have a middleman, if I'm if you haven't hired me to negotiate your case, though, Courtney, your response is, you know what, Bob, that sounds like a great option. I need to go home and talk to Brian about this. Mm -hmm. OK, use your partner, your spouse, use your business partner as an excuse to take a break or as an excuse not to answer that question. Mm -hmm. You know, that sounds like an interesting proposition, but Brian would kill me if I said yes or no to it right now. Let's get back to each other tomorrow afternoon and talk about this a little bit more. So yeah. you can still use that technique without an actual middleman. I like that. Always yeah, got to have great. a fall guy. <laughs> so we had um, Top Cat on Twitter. It was kind of a comment slash question. I'm going to turn. I'm going to make sure. I'm going to turn it into a question. Um, what do you need during negotiations that are flatlining, that catches them off guard and perhaps moves it into a solution? Facts. If you've got, uh, we had a case. So if I understand the question correctly is, look, you're, if, you're, if you're beating up on the other side, if you're throwing all the punches and I've got you in the corner and I'm throwing all the punches, if I still need you to say yes, but because I'm beating you up, you're never gonna say yes, that's not a, a very productive negotiation uh, approach. We had a case, Brian, where we, uh, we had a case where a young man was tragically killed riding his watercraft. And uh, we filed the case and it ended up going into federal court, a federal jury trial. In federal court, we needed a unanimous jury verdict. Uh, in this case, it was eight out of eight. In wow. state court, we only needed nine out of 11. But the other side removed it to federal court for jurisdiction reasons. And before trial, the other side offered us one dollar to settle the case. And without going into all the details, we tried the case and the jury came back with a verdict of, seven figure verdict, uh, 1.2, 1.3 million, whatever it was. During the middle of that trial, we spent four hours talking about a legal doctrine that would have completely barred our case called the assumption of risk. Did this young man assume the risk of riding his watercraft in the Lake ha in Lake Havasu? Uh, and if so, does that prevent us from bringing a claim for the wrongful death caused by the negligence of someone else? The judge listened to our argument and ruled in our favor. He said, in this particular case, the assumption of risk doctrine doesn't apply. After the verdict, the other side's insurance company reached out to us and uh, wanted us to cut four or $500,000 off the verdict based upon the assumption of risk. The claims adjuster didn't realize that we had already discussed this in detail during the trial. The defense attorney never brought it up to the claims adjuster. As I was negotiating with the claims adjuster after our verdict and before appeal, what I quickly realized is that the claims adjuster wasn't aware of this particular fact. And I made sure by asking open-ended questions that the concerns that he had about the verdict were totally focused on the assumption of risk doctrine. No other legal issues, no other arguments. That's what he was, Mitch, if it was up to me, I'd pay this verdict. But because of the assumption of risk, you know, we're going to have to work together. So I, I let him build his case. And then I came in with the zinger. Are you aware that on day two of trial for four hours in open court on the record, we discussed this issue and the judge ruled in our favor and it was quiet on the other end of the phone. <laughs> and didn't know that. And we received the check about a week later. So facts matter in life, in business, in law, in negotiation, and frankly, in politics too, but we'll save that for another show. Well, I, that's been in the back of my mind the whole time you've been talking because, you know, just this morning I was reading, uh, there's a, a woman online on Medium who's been keeping track of the, the, the slipping indications of democracy <laughs> that our current administration is, is taking away by normalizing um, lies and, you know, misguidance. And, you know, so what's your best advice for, you know, us regular citizens that are having to deal with this? <laughs> so there are consequences to what we say and do. And sometimes those consequences take time. And I think it's always smart to do the right thing, to tell the truth. Uh, I've, had, I've had cases, Courtney, where we've used social media evidence in court. I had a witness on the stand 
who spent about 30 minutes telling the jury what a great guy he was and how he would never use these words when describing a woman. And it was every single word you could think of that was relevant in this case. And I let him go on and on and on. When we were done, when he was done on cross-examination, I stood up and I pulled up his Facebook page. and He didn't know I had his Facebook wall. And of course, everything that I asked him, I paraphrased from what he had said on Facebook. So when the jury saw that, the jurors just rolled their eyes and discounted everything that knucklehead had to say. So I think my takeaway for me is when I see people on social media saying things and doing things, whether they're commenting or they're selling products that they don't have the rights to or they're stealing other people's stuff. The long story short is there are consequences. And, you know, uh, and although it may take time, I think eventually the truth does rise to the top. And uh, frankly, it's every it's someone else's problem. It's not my problem. It's not your problem. It's not Brian's problem. I mean, we just you just have to do the right thing. And when you see someone that's not doing the right thing, I wrote a blog post about this, uh, about, you know, doing the right thing. You know, don't be silent. Don't let other people get harmed or hurt. Step up and do the right thing. And if you do so from your heart and if you do so with good intentions and you do so where you're trying to protect your community like we do offline with our neighborhood watches, you know, uh, I think someone would be hard pressed to say that you, I, or Brian was doing the wrong thing. You know, I, this makes me um, think my, my dad growing up, he was a, uh, he was a f- physician and, and off and the, oftentimes he would take care of people that, uh, that were very sick and, um, and, and would pass away that day. And he'd come home that night, we'd sit down to dinner and eventually it was, it wasn't like he just play, uh, you know, that every day was normal, but it, it, that he would he would separate himself. I'd imagine yeah. law is the same way. And the reason that I say that is because you do do the right thing. Uh, you try to do the right thing. Or even in negotiations, you try to do the right thing, but it doesn't always come out with the right person on top. Um, how do you get through that day and still sit down at dinner and say, man, I did my best. Yeah. It's too bad they, you know, the, the, the worst person, the, the better person didn't win. So let me just say that we, that being in the American judicial system, I happen to know for a fact it's the best system in the world, okay? More times than not, justice prevails. What you see on the news, what you, what you read in the newspaper, generally if there's something funny going on, the reason you're reading it is that's what makes news. But that's not really what's happening every single day in our, in our American courthouses. And I'm very good at compartmentalizing these types of issues, Brian, when I come home from, you know, a wrongful death case that's taking two weeks and it's, and it's just sad, it's tragic. I can come home and, 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 you know, hang that issue up in the worry tree when I walk in the front door of my home and then I'll deal with it the next morning when I come back out. Uh, My wife, Lisa, who's been my partner, we've been married for 28 years and she's been my partner for all of those years. Um, You know, she, she wears her emotions on her sleeve. I mean, that's what makes her a great trial lawyer. And I think she has a, a little, you know, bigger challenge with, with not talking about it over the dinner table. So I don't know what's right or wrong. It just depends on, you know, what works for you. But um, it's an interest. you know, my dad told me when I told you guys off the air, I'm the first one from my, immediately fam- my immediate family to go to college, much less go to law school. And I remember some buddies of mine were telling me, hey, Mitch, you know, why are you going to law school? There's already too many lawyers out there. And my dad, who was a very street smart cowboy businessman in Tucson, uh, said, you know, Mitch, there's always room for another good lawyer. If you want to make a difference and make the world better, you need to get involved. And I still remember that to, to this day. My dad and mom both passed away years ago. But I remember my dad telling me, if you want to make a difference and if you want to make the world better, then... Um, then get involved. And Brian, I know you're a Rotarian. One reason that my family, my wife and I are both past presidents of our Rotary Club, I'm the district interact governor this year, or I was, or I am until July 1st. Uh, Our kids are both active in interact is because we want to get involved with our community, uh, both locally, nationally, and internationally, and make a difference. And so um, it's exciting to have made a small difference in the type of cases that we've handled, the clients that we've represented. We've actually created new law in the state of California, which I'm very proud of. And uh, it's been a fun ride. And so my personality, Brian, is I've always been that guy that, you know, 
that's willing to drop gloves and protect someone that's being bullied. And so I look at it as going into court and uh, taking on the bullies. And normally, if you out hustle, if you out overwork, if you over prepare, out prepare the other side, generally speaking, you're going to come out on top. Mm -hmm. What what got you interested in the bullying issue in the first place? You know, it's probably just watching my mom and dad when I was growing up on the ranch. We grew up on a ranch in Tucson and we had guests come and stay with us. Uh, A lot of celebrities, by the way, that would say Morley Safer from 60 Minutes, John Wayne, uh, Rock Hudson, a lot of people that you guys would know. And I watched my dad and mom interact with these people. And whenever anybody at the ranch was being bullied by someone else, my dad would step up. He was a cowboy. He'd step up and, and even if you were a paying guest, if he didn't like what he what you had to say, Courtney or, or Brian, he would he would ask you to leave. And if you didn't, he'd make sure you were leaving. <laughs> and uh, and it was a, it was he was old school cowboy. So I watched that. And then I watched some friends in school who were uh, getting bullied. I played sports. I didn't have that issue. I was a minority at my school. And that's another broadcast. But I watched some friends of mine get bullied and I I just could not stand by and, and watch that happen. So for me, it's kind of like what gets me up every morning is just trying to protect, you know, people trying to trying to make sure that the two of you have the legal right to walk into a courtroom and take on a large corporation that's that's done something wrong. And our our American legal system allows the two of you to do just that inside of a courtroom. It's the two of you and me on one side of counsel table. It's another attorney and somebody representing a huge Fortune 500 company next to us. And it's game on and it levels the playing field. And that, Courtney, is one of the reasons I'm so concerned with what I'm seeing right now out of D.C. is that I'm seeing these rights being stripped away. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the consumer just doesn't know any better. The consumer has a better understanding as to the names of the Orange County housewives than they do who's sitting on the U.S. Supreme Court. And that's not okay. So for me, it's kind of a delicate dance and we're kind of deviating from negotiation, but it's a delicate dance for me on social because I want to use what influence I have, what experiences uh, I have on social to raise awareness to these issues because I'm passionate about it. But I also don't want to be that lawyer asshole that's telling everybody what to do. So it's, it's, it's a gray area that I'm trying to stay out of. And oftentimes, I dive right in the middle of it. And then everybody reminds me of that. And that's cool too. You know, just to, just, just to finish out on that, that thought right there, it is an interesting time on social media because of politics. Not that I'm trying to turn this into a complete political discussion, but what I am seeing, I'm sure you guys have seen the same thing just over the last election is that, uh, that there is not, it's not negotiation. It's arguing. Yeah, I think there's a difference between quality negotiation and bullying and lying. Okay, Uh, so there's a difference between the two. And I think it's important that people realize that. I'm just not sure people do. And that's what really gets under my skin. Mm. Yeah. Is Uh, it because they don't care or they just don't know? You know, I'll tell you what, I know a lot, you know, a lot of Americans are hurting and I get that. And um, there's an old formula in politics. If you want to get elected in politics, you make you make you say what people want to hear and you make promises. That's how you get elected. OK. And uh, that for me, that's what I saw happen. And uh, we'll see what happens. We have a check and balance. And that's the other thing is I'm very optimistic about the checks and balances in our American uh, political system. Okay. And so we have a lot of people who are using social media that are speaking their mind, that are sharing their thoughts and that are checking and fact checking what all of us are doing. I mean, not just politicians, but the three of us. Right. And I think that's a good thing. I love the transparency with social. I think once we get all of this stuff worked out, here's an example. Um, I had, uh, uh, drinks, but I don't drink. I had seven up with Brian Solis two weeks ago. He was down the street from our house. Okay. He was speaking about something. And Brian had written an article about tort reform and his source was the U S chamber of commerce. And I shared with Brian, my version on another perspective on before he writes this article, he might want to source check some of the things that he was going to say. And by sitting down with him and talking and showing him another position on these issues, He didn't write the article. He's still working on it now. Wow. So I think by having a conversation, we can raise awareness. We can we can help educate each other. And social media allows us to do that on a on a global platform. Right. 
And so the other the other caveat with all of that is I also have learned with social is I'm not going to waste my time trying to convince people to do something. For example, I tell people, if you're doing business on social media, do business as a corporation or a limited liability company. There are all types of liability protections. There are all types of tax advantages. You can maximize your employee retirement plans. There's just a million different positives to doing business as an entity. If somebody doesn't do it, then that's their choice. I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I've shared my thoughts. I've shared my ideas. And now I'm moving on. And I feel the same way about most of these other issues that the three of us have commented on on the social media platforms. People just need to be careful with who they're doing business with. They need to do their due diligence and don't blindly follow people on social media just because they're good on stage. Because while that's a great quality to have, it has nothing to do with whether or not you can do business. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. That's great advice. I, so let's finish out with, um, with with just you know everything that you've learned, you talked through these five steps of the su successful negotiation uh, process. Um, and what um, what I'd love to finish on is just uh, a couple things that you have you've learned in your career. You you might consider uh, now at this point maybe um, wrote. You know you you always just do these things uh, that when you enter a, right. a discussion or you enter the courtroom or you enter a discussion even online with someone else or even on what we're doing right now on live video. Um, but what what have you learned? What are, what's a couple of things that you've learned that you that you know would make people successful in not having to get into a place that gets too far out of hand? So you're going to like this answer and it's not a canned answer, but it's the truth. And and what I've learned is to be human. And, and I and I sincerely mean that um, a lot of men and women in my profession, they feel like they need to act a certain way. They need to be a certain way. And they actually have built their brands in their careers and their trial or negotiation skills almost in a robotic sense, okay? They, they follow the code of civil procedure and the evidence code as opposed, as opposed to just being a human being in the courtroom. So Brian, my answer to that question is, for me being human, being brave enough to 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 just speak like everyone else in the courtroom and not use big words and not use Latin terms, I want to be that guy sitting, you know, that's sitting up there in the jury box, you know, where geez, Mitch would be, I don't know why he's at the council table. He should be sitting with me up in the jury box. He's just like my neighbor at home. I mean, that is who I am. And so by by being brave enough to display and use and show and just be a human being. That's key to success in the negotiation room. It's been my key to success in the courtroom, especially when you speak from the heart. And I think it's really, really helped me quickly uh, on the social media platforms, um, build the brand and the reputation that the only brand and reputation I'm interested in building. And that's one of caring, being a human being, being honest and trying to make a difference. So that's, but it took me 15 years of practice to figure that out, Brian. <laughs> it's, you know, it's funny. Okay, let's put that out. It was, this is not an overnight thing. Well, first of all, I, uh, Courtney, stop mirroring me. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Oh man. So, um, you, it's, it's, it's kind of funny because I remember, um, uh, that when, when you, you and I are both into drones, um, and we have this kind of fun um, little messenger thing going on with John Ferrara, Brian Solis, you, you, you and me, I think. And um, and and every time a new drone comes out, there's a message about it, and we all we all uh, get the you know shiny penny syndrome. Um, but it was yeah. funny because there was this one little uh, thing about a drone. I can't remember what it was, but it was news about how drones uh, could do like follow you or something like that. You were in court when you received it, and you said, "I just turned around and showed it to the judge." And now he wants one. And you ended up like, I think, dismissing the case because you guys had such rapport over this drone. And you thank yeah. me for sharing that because it was the perfect piece of information that you could share <laughs> with the judge on drones. And I'm like, that is the most random piece of information I could have given you to to do something like that. You know, and I knew that particular judge was was interested in drones. Uh, similar story, Brian. And by the way, don't be. The point is, don't be afraid to to have a conversation with the other side. Opposing counsel, Brian. When I'm dealing with opposing counsel on a case where I don't know the other attorney, the first thing I do is pick up the phone and I call the other attorney, or I'll use BombBomb now and I'll send a video email. 
And I don't talk about the case. I just call and introduce myself, uh, try to just small talk and see where the, where the conversation goes. I don't even bring up our case. Okay, I wanna develop rapport with opposing counsel. Had a case where there, we had a judge in Orange County that was a hardcore UCLA Bruin. And when you go into his chambers, he has all the Bruin paraphernalia, the hats, it's blue and gold, whatever the colors are. And I should know, cause my daughter went there. And I remember a young attorney coming, coming into court. And I said, you know, when you go back into chambers, make sure you talk to the judge about USC football. He's a big USC fan, right? So this, this snotty, smart aleck lawyer goes back into chambers and he comes back out and his face is white. And he goes, you son of a bitch. And I said, what? He goes, he's a UCLA fan, not a USC fan. I said, I know. I just wanted to see how observant you'd be when you went back there. I mean, how could you not notice all the UCLA <laughs> fans? So the guy, the guy just got a kick out of the fact that I busted his chops a little bit. And we laughed about it. And we're friends today. And so it's always good to you know, pay attention to your surroundings, figure out what other people are interested in, and take those experiences into the ne negotiation room and use them in a genuine way. We're not talking about bullshitting anybody. I mean, genuinely be interested in what other people are doing. And when you do that and you show your human side in the negotiation room, in the business world, or in court, that's where the magic happens. And give yourself permission to do all the above. Give yourself permission to be human. It's okay to be a human being. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay not to be perfect. And once you figure that out, life is good. You're Very you're good. you're uh preaching the choir here. We totally agree and, I know. Um, and I know. really uh, appreciate you being on, Mitch. This has been a really informative, um, fun hour uh, mm -hmm. and, and especially uh, really good because we, we appreciate you and, and everything that you're doing in the community just to, to raise a level of awareness for, uh, for legal uh, legal reasons and for everything that um, you know is, is, is happening right now and, and what you can do to help people on, on that. So where can people find you? So the easiest place to find find me, and thanks for asking, Brian, would be streaming.lawyer. That's a blog I've set up a couple of years ago before the first social media day, San Diego, that I went to as a civilian. And that's where I share a lot of my social media and live streaming efforts. Uh, I'll be sharing more 360 and AR, MR, VR, and AI stuff at that particular blog. So streaming.lawyer is the best place to connect with me. Well, Nazim just said that he wishes you would practice law over in Italy in uh, um, uh, Milan. So you already have a, a, a friend in Milan. Um, Thank you. And congratulations because we trended on Twitter, thanks to you and your wisdom bombs that were being dropped. Ooh, I like that. My daughter's gonna roll her eyes, but I'm gonna rub that. <laughs> Your dad is cool like that, right? Just tell her that. Yeah. All right, guys. Can, I, can you say, I'm going to record that. Thanks so much, Mitch. Really appreciate it. Again, everyone, We this is our last, uh, last one for the season. Our next season begins again on uh, the first week of August. Uh, we're just taking a sabbatical in July. Um, and, uh, and, and we will be sharing again the, the survey out. Please do take that. It helps us to plan future content for areas that we know that you're interested in learning about mm -hmm. and having great guests like Mitch on in the future. So thanks again, Mitch. Really appreciate you being here. And to everyone else out there, thanks for attending for all your great questions and your comments and for the great engagement today. Cheers, everybody. Thank you. Have a great summer. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.